so I'll start with my presentation. My presentation title is Deep Learning Based Security Solutions for Internet of Medical Devices. This work I had uh, uh, done in my post doctorate and uh, that's what I would be presenting. It was a US Qatar joint collaborative work between Temple University, University of Idaho and Qatar University. The agenda for this particular talk would be, I'll be talking about um, what exactly uh, is uh, medical devices, then what are the attacks that can be introduced in Internet of Medical Devices, what are the existing solutions, with, uh, like what are the advantages and disadvantages, what were the algorithms I had proposed using deep learning based algorithms for providing security in these medical devices, and finally conclusions and future work. So uh, Internet of Things, everyone is aware, like imagine that you wake up in the morning and you see your curtains are already pulled out. You um, have your coffee machine already poured in your coffee, coffee uh, mug. Then you go outside, it was uh, snowing and, um, and there was uh, in the refrigerator, there were vegetables already clean. Uh, there were no vegetables and uh, suddenly in the morning, you see all the vegetables are in the refrigerators. Then you see outside that the, it was snowing and uh, your uh, car did not have snow at all. It was removed. And then you had a doctor's appointment and all your vital parameters, including your blood pressure and everything gets transmitted to the uh, doctor. All this is possible using Internet of Things. And... Um, if we look at the stats of Internet of Things, if we would look that uh, by 2025, there would be 75 billion connected devices all over the world. The, the medical uh, devices by 23, which is next year, would be 208 billion. Similarly, smart grid uh, investments would be very high, which is 13.8. So if we would look at Internet of Things devices, it can be connected vehicles, it could be devices which include smart city, smart infrastructure, it could be medical devices, it could be smart grid investment and so on. Initially it was just machine to human interaction, uh, then we are transitioned into sensor driven. So all of this transition is happening due to sensors being in, engraved in these smart devices, whether it is connected vehicle, whether it is medical devices and so on. So if we would look at how these systems have evolved with time, there was a centralized system where every processing was done on a centralized machine. But later with time, we had distributed system where the system was distributed in a, uh, in a way that we had distributed the overall algorithm and there was parallel processing which was happening between these distributed systems. With time, we have transitioned into self-organizing autonomous systems, which include autonomous connected vehicles as well, where autonomously these vehicles capture the information through their IoT sensors and then make uh, good decisions or efficient decisions. But with time, there are also some characteristics we can observe with Internet of Things devices, which include scalability, which include mobility, and which also include diversity. By scalability, it is the number of um, devices that can be added in the system is, um, is uh, plenty. In terms of their mobility, that's the reason they become autonomous. And because of diversification, it is not just a single sensor node, but it is a diversification of different sensors taking different information and how we process these all of these sensor information to make a congregate and a single solution out there. I specifically would be talking on internet of medical devices. So if we would look at medical devices, medical devices have been since uh, ancient time. Uh, if we have to look at contact lenses, this is also a kind of medical device. But uh, I am specifically looking at implantable medical devices. These are devices that are either installed in inside the patient body or it is outside installed, but there is no doctor and caregiver who would be regularly monitoring. It is the device which would be regularly monitoring the parameter of a patient. With this, what happens is that these uh, uh, um, internet of medical devices, they allow the system to diagnose, to prevent, to monitor, to treat, 
to control and to even alleviate different kinds of diseases. I have specifically looked on three different kinds of devices, which is brain stimulator, cardiac defibrillator, which is the pacemaker, and one is the insulin pump. With the advantages that we have for with respect to Internet of Medical Devices, as I said, that it can treat even chronic uh, medical devices, there are also certain challenges. And uh, these challenges I, that I'm specifically looking is at the security aspect. So if we have to look at the security in these uh, Internet of Medical Devices, um, initially the very first uh, security attack that had happened in these uh, medical devices was when the uh, hacker or an anomalous uh, agent had tracked down the medical device and was asking some kind of ransom with, uh, with respect to these patients who was taking these implantable medical devices treatment. This had happened initially, but there were also rep reported, um, uh, I would say, um, stats, which was uh, saying some kind of anomalous behavior with respect to what uh, the continuous measurement, which was being sent versus the anomalous behavior, which was sent. We can look at the security aspect at different levels, but if we, since these medical devices or Internet of Things devices are closely related with the wireless technology, there is a key chance that there would be hacker who would be eavesdropping the um, measurement which is being transmitted between the medical device to the doctor or to the caregiver and can manipulate these kind of measurements which are transmitted. The, these can not only manipulate but also affect the overall well-being of a patient. So if, as I said, the uh, attacks can happen or a fault can be introduced in a medical device at three different levels. One is at the storage level where the data is being actually collected. The second level that happens is at when the uh, measurements are being sent from the device to the application center, which could be the doctor or the caregiver. So during the transmission, there could be attacks or faults being introduced, as well as, as the, at the aggregator level where, where there is a doctor or a caregiver which is monitoring this kind of measurements there also the attacks can happen because of the manipulation of the data set at a centralized position. So we have to look at different, different aspects, whether it is reliability, whether in terms of quality, whether it is in terms of efficiency of these medical devices, because it is directly or indirectly affecting the overall health or the well-being of a patient who is receiving this medical therapy. So as I said, there could be two kinds of attacks mainly. This, which is at the internal attack, which could be on the device itself, or it could be the communication attack, which is being communicated between uh, the medical device and the doctor and the caregiver. So if we would look at just at the device level, there could be attacks like calibration attack, connectional hardware attack, low battery attack, modified data attack, malware software attack. I have specifically looked in introducing faults and anomalies in these medical devices to make the measurements anomalous and fraudulent so that these patients which are receiving the medical ther therapy, they are not receiving the correct stimulation, but, uh, but they are receiving some kind of fraudulent or anomalous based measurement. So I have specifically looked at these internal attacks which manipulate the measurements and starts giving bad measurements to these medical patients. There are uh, another set of attacks that can happen, as I said, during the communication when the uh, devices are uh, taking the in, uh, taking these measurements and once they are taking the measurements, they are sending these measurements to the doctor and the caregiver after a certain amount of time. So that time attacks can happen, which include eavesdropping, man in the middle attack, denial of service attack, spoofing attack, device capture and trapping attack. I haven't looked at this particular aspect. I have specifically looked at internal attacks by introducing faults and anomalies in these medical devices. So now looking at what are the security solutions which are already present in these medical devices. One uh, is access control mechanism where uh, you can, uh, uh, the patients uh, can be authorized to use the medical devices if there are certain biometrics associated, whether it could be iris recognition or it could be fingerprint recognition and so on. Then only those patients and the doctors and caregivers can access these medical devices. There could be second type of uh, 
uh, as a, a security solutions could be distance based uh, security solutions where during just as close pro uh, proximity only those doctors and caregivers can look at the medical device there are key management protocols which include cryptography where a key is exchanged between the medical device and the patient as well as the doctor and caregiver to basically look at the, um, uh, the signals which are being transmitted from these medical devices to the doctor. So these are the just access control mechanism which is looking at uh, only authorized people should be able to access these medical devices. There is second type of security mechanism, which is already inbuilt in inter, uh, this Internet of Medical Devices, which is with respect to collecting uh, information from these um, in, uh, medical devices and tracking if there is an abnormality. It is just looking at the audit of these medical devices and looking if there is certain changes in the previous uh, behavior. The third type of anomaly detection techniques include sub machine learning algorithm. And I have specifically looked at these anomaly detection based mechanism, which include different kinds of machine learning algorithm. Initially support vector machine was uh, deployed and, uh, but it had certain issues. That's the reason I moved into deep learning based algorithm. The fourth kind of uh, security solutions which are present is external devices that besides these medical devices, these patients have to carry another external device to authenticate whether uh, uh, the uh, measurement which is being sent to the patient is anomalous or not. But uh, with external devices also, we have reported some kind of uh, disadvantages. If you would look at this particular comparative analysis table, you would see that how um, these all of these uh, existing solutions has certain advantages, but they also have certain uh, amount of disadvantages. As I said, biometric based approaches um, lack uh, standardization. They are um, they change with respect to time, so that's the reason that that are not advantages. The distance and proximity based algorithms have some kind of weak authentication because the patient or the doctor has to be in near proximity to authenticate. Key management protocols uh, have decreased reliability and extra waiting time for authentication because the keys have to be exchanged and so on. Audit mecha mechanism exhausts the uh, medical devices, uh, uh, I would say, uh, data. That's the reason audit mechanism is not preferred. Anomaly detection, specifically support vector machine drains battery. And uh, finally, the external device methodology includes um, that uh, there is an external device that has to be carried besides the medical devices. If you would look at the rise of deep learning um, over the past few years, we have seen that deep uh, learning has revolutionized many aspects of research and industry, including autonomous vehicles, medicine and healthcare. I would say um, reinforcement learning, robotics, uh, even natural la uh, language processing, finance and security, and um, medical research in general. What is deep learning? If we have to look at the different types of uh, machine learning or artificially uh, artificial learning based algorithm, uh, the artificial uh, intelligence is the outermost umbrella, which include machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning helps us in extracting the patterns from uh, data using the basic neural network, which is uh, inspired from human brain in general, where neurons uh, take in the information and process the information based on a feedback-based mechanism. Why specifically deep learning-based algorithms? Because traditionally, machine learning algorithms typically define a set of rules and features that um, you want to extract from the data and they are not able to extract the low level features. And uh, if we have high level features, they, then we can easily learn with respect to deep learning. Uh, yeah, that's no, the reason. I'm, I'm this summer, June 1st, I'm gonna get them, I'm gonna get them. All right, bye. Uh, sorry, uh, was there any question? Oh, was I, was I unmuted? Uh, somebody was talking, I'm sorry. Uh, not sure who was talking. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Did you guys hear that? Yes. <laughs> oh no. 
It's okay. Uh, so um, why now we are looking at deep learning based solution is because um, big, uh, because of the data, big data, we have larger data sets, we have uh, like immense amount of collection and storage available at different kinds of uh, um, companies. Then we have better hardware in terms of uh, GPUs, in terms of uh, FPGAs, which allows us a massive parallelism between uh, allowing multiple algorithms running in parallel and as well as better softwares provided by these open source, I would say Python and other kind of uh, uh, machine learning algorithms which are present out there. Uh, why I have specifically used deep learning is because of my um, past background in um, biology. I'm uh, keenly interested in taking inspiration from human brains. Uh, presently, my work, as I said, is based on reinforcement learning algorithm by mimicking the brain structure. And initially, when I started looking at neural networks, these are also inspired from um, human brain. And if I have to ask, uh, and this is just a question to everyone. If I have to ask, what do you think computer is more efficient or our brain is efficient? What would be your answer? Okay, so uh, if we could look at um, um, like how a neural network is designed, everything, uh, everyone is aware that we have weights initially, we have some inputs that we give to a network. And these inputs are uh, introduced with some kind of weights and biasness. And then these weights along with the inputs are forwarded in a network which processes and gives us uh, an output. The uh, desired output and the actual output is then differentiated or we calculate the loss function between the two, which is the actual versus the desired output. And then we calculate the derivative of the error. And then we back propagate all of this learnings that we have done to adjust the weight which is given inside these inputs. So this is just a basic neural network approach which, ha uh, which has uh, where people uh, take inspiration from these deep learning based algorithms to design uh, different and efficient systems. What are the key uh, uh, contributions that I have done using these deep learning based algorithms in, um, in medical devices is that I have used uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, model, long short-term memory, uh, deep learning based algorithm, even dynamic time warping along with some kind of uh, uh, Legendre uh, uh, approximation algorithms to develop more security towards three kinds of medical devices. One is insulin pump, second is cardiac defibrillator, and the third one is deep brain implants. Uh, the performance matrix that I, uh, I have taken as well as all deep learning based algorithms generally look, is, uh, look at is accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score. And I think everyone is aware of these four metrics which are used in different kind of machine learning algorithm. So let's start with the very first uh, medical device, which is an insulin pump. So in an insulin pump, what happens is that if you would look at uh, this device, this is either inserted inside the patient body or it is, or it is outside the patient body. There is a remote control, which, uh, which the patient can take con control in order to um, stimulate a kind of measurement. And basically this insulin pump is just to regulate your glucose content inside your um, body. Besides this, there is a sensor and a transmitter which sends this information to a continuous glucose monitoring system, which is generally present at the doctor and the caregiver side. Besides this, there is also this medical device, which is insulin pump, is also configured with a smartphone or a laptop to take access of these medical device measurements. Besides this, there is also one one-touch meter associated with this insulin pump to check whether it is giving the correct glucose content inside the body or not. So if we would look at this entire insulin pump framework, there are several, um, I would say, wireless uh, measurements that is happening or transmission which is happening between this insulin pump and different kinds of other medical devices which is whether it is a remote control or one touch meter or a smart laptop or a continuous uh, glucose monitoring system. If we would look at a typical behavior of uh, uh, a diabetic uh, patient, uh, these glucose contents changes with time. Uh, whenever a person eats something, 
uh, whether it is breakfast, lunch, or at the dinner, the glucose con uh, co content suddenly increases. So these uh, insulin pump, what it does it, it regulates this glucose content so that it doesn't affect the na normal processing of the patient body. So I had specifically used, uh, uh, tried to manipulate the measurement which is happening at link number one and link number two to basically investigate if a wrong type of measurement is being given inside the insulin pump, then what happens? Initially, the model was trained on 30,000 uh, samples and I had taken the UCI machine learning um, data set for diabetic patient. Initially, it was just the four features, which is date, date time, value, and label. And link two was uh, made malicious so that it was giving wrong kind of measurement inside the insulin pump. There were initially, since there were only four feature, output dimension was just one, whether it was classifying, whether it is the correct stimulation or not. So it was uh, flagging either as fraudulent or benevolent. And uh, I used rectified activation function on the initial layers and sigmoid at the output. When it was initially evaluated with the hidden layer just three, the accuracy which was received was between, um, I would say, nine, it was greater than 98% with, uh, uh, with uniform distribution. And you can see the graphs uh, of various graphs with respect to loss and other kinds of uh, things. One second. Sorry. So uh, uh, here, uh, then if you would look at the overall uh, results, it was uh, uh, hidden layer uh, with, with respect to different hidden layers. The accuracy, if you would see with uniform distribution, it was 98.27% with respect to the other kind of validation split and different kinds of uh, RMS prop, it was quite less. Then uh, after that, since it was just my initial studies, um, I had uh, looked at the Bayesian network topology in giving the uncertainty of the overall environment by looking at the failure probability if just one link is broken versus if all the links are broken. So there was a Bayesian network uh, model that I had developed in terms of looking at the reliability of these links and Bayesian uh, rule was diagnosed in order to check whether if one um, link is failed, then what happens versus if all the links are failed. Uh, a network reliability graph can demonstrate uh, the attack probability versus the failure probability. When there was no security in the system, the failure probability was quite high. But if all the components were secured the fa uh, the, uh, uh, and the attack probability is high, the overall failure probability was also very low. So it was ranging from 90% to 10% chance of having a successful attack on different kinds of components with respect to different signals. Since I initially in my first, fourth, fifth slide where I had discussed about how we can do comparative analysis, uh, the support vector machine was the initial model which was developed when I did the comparative analysis of deep learning based algorithm with support vector machine. It was seen that deep learning based algorithm had 93.98% accuracy versus the support vector machine was having just 77% uh, accuracy. The second, uh, after that, I moved my algorithm on the FPGA because everything so far was just done on the uh, on the um, the Keras library and everything, but then I did it on the actual uh, uh, field programmable gate array. This time I trained the overall network on a different number of uh, features. Initially it was just four features, which is what is the age, what is the date and time received. But in this, uh, this uh, training, I used age, plasma glucose concentration, diabetic blood pressure, uh, skin blood th thickness, serum insulin, uh, what was the BMI, what is the uh, date, time, value, which was trained and, um, and it was just a, sing a single output function which was giving classification whether it was a anomalous behavior versus it was a um, uh, like good behavior. When uh, this multi-layer perceptron model was trained along with support vector machine, 
I uh, uh, it was seeing some good uh, results with respect to the multi-layer perceptron model as modeled in this table. It was 98% accurate versus in support vector machine, it was 90.17%. However, if you would look at the uh, actual hardware utilization, you would see the number of device utilization, whether in terms of slices, registers, lookup tables, and RAM, and even DSP, it was deep learning was consuming a lot of energy in comparison to the support vector machine, which was taking a bit lesser than that. But since, um, and I have even argued in my um, results that I have presented, since we are looking at the overall of quality of these medical devices, which is not affecting the human patient body, that's the reason deep learning based algorithm was more uh, efficient, I would say in comparison to the present uh, uh, machine learning algorithm. The third uh, kind of um, work that I had um, looked was on, I would say, uh, dynamic time warping algorithm, and it was on just on the authentication level. So what was happening is, and this work was done on uh, cardiac defibrillator, which is uh, we receive these ECG signals. So these ECG signal, which is received, com comprises of PQ. RST signal, where QRS signal is the most, uh, I would say, efficient signal in a PQRST complex. So those features were extracted and it was sent to a dynamic time warping algorithm, which is nothing, but it sh shows the similarities between two kinds of signals. So this is a template, which is where I, uh, I was authorizing for a doctor or for a patient versus the actual ECG signal, which was sent. So if the sim similarity coefficient between the actual patient which is receiving the medical treatment versus with uh, some kind of other standardized data set, it was uh, seen that when the match confidence was greater than 90%, then only authentication was given to the authorized medical um, patient or a doctor or a caregiver. If the match confidence was much lesser than 80%, it was giving. Um, we were not authorizing these medical devices, uh, um, like whether they would be able to acquire from the actual uh, uh, patient or the caregiver. The fourth kind of uh, work, which was similar in line with the cardiac defibrillator, was with respect to collecting this ECG signal. And as I said, QRS complex is the most efficient uh, complex, which is... Uh, which is important in finding whether it is for a particular individual uh, with whom we are collecting these ECG signal or not. So what I had initially done was I had extracted this ECG signal. Uh, then out of this, a QRS complex was extracted and it was passed into this Legendre polynomial approximation algorithm to generate some kind of coefficients. These coefficients, if you would see C0, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C, C6 and C7, these were polynomial, this was given by Legendre polynomial approximation algorithm. Then these uh, Legendre polynomial approximation algorithm, these generated coefficient was given to this uh, multi-layer perceptron model to give authorization to these medical devices. What I mean by saying this is that when these coefficient was more uh, towards patients and doctors, they would be giving the, um, uh, like here the output classification was not just one signal, but it was uh, 10 or more uh, doctors and patients who can actually access these medical devices. If with time, if the patient or the doctors are changing, then these coefficients were further trained. So now if you would look at the next slide, you would see how does the difference in the coefficient made a difference. So if uh, this Legendre polynomial approximation algorithm can give five coefficients, seven coefficients based on how you are training this overall algorithm. So when we just take uh, the original signal, if you would see this is dot uh, demonstrated by these blue dots. If we took seven degree, seven coefficients out of this Legendre polynomial approximation, the original signal versus the seventh degree coefficient is quite matching. Versus if we just take four, say uh, uh, four coefficient, it is slightly different with the original one. 
if we would look at with respect to if uh, with uh, if we are training this overall algorithm with with five people or 10 people this approximation was quite efficient and you can see how this uh, signals are also changing finally um, since these signals were transmitted we we had used these algorithms to train on different kind of ma machine learning algorithm and support vector machine and if you would see that it was uh, testing accuracy was uh, 100%, whether it was five, if we are using five, uh, five questions, six coefficient for seven coefficient, but with respect to seven coefficient, uh, the uh, overall, I would say um, accuracy was 99.75% uh, and uh, the time complexity and space complexity is also compared over here. In terms of hardware implementation, the local nodes where these QRS signals are computed can be deployed on the FPGA and then they are transmitted on the edge nodes where these medical devices or uh, uh, practitioners are taking these, uh, these measurements. Finally, the last work which I did was on deep brain implants. This, this was my favorite work uh, um, among all the medical devices that I had taken. And if you would look, what happens in these deep brain implants is there is a stimulator which is giving some kind of stimulation to a tremor patient. So Parkinson disease patient who have different kinds of tremors inside the body. So uh, this stimulation is given and we monitor the rest tremor velocity. For a normal person who is not having a Parkinson or a tremor, uh, this uh, the index finger never moves, but if for a Parkinson patient, if we just uh, put this index fing finger and if we would look at the rest tremor velocity, we would observe certain kind of deviation. So this overall algorithm was monitoring whether this rest tremor velocity deviates when this uh, stimulation is given inside the uh, patient or not. So the overall algorithm, or I would say the uh, stimulation, has some kind of pulse width, has some kind of stimulation rate as well as intensity associated with this stimulation which is being given. So if an adversary tries to hijack this medical device which is uh, normally inserted either inside or outside the neck of the patient, it can manipulate the pulse width, it can manipulate the intensity or it can manipulate the stimulation rate. And with respect to that, the overall stimulation inside the body gets changed. I had uh, used long short-term memory, which is a kind of recurrent neural network in order to train the stimulation, which is given inside the uh, Parkinson disease patient. If you would uh, look, if uh, uh, a uh, for a patient G, the rest tremor velocity with stimulation on and medication on. So what happens with these uh, med uh, uh, deep brain implants is that besides the stimulation, they also look at the medication. They are being provided with a different kind of medication. So with medic uh, medication uh, on and stimulation on, the rest tremor velocity is always close to zero, which means that your finger is, your index finger is not moving when both are on. However, if the stimulation is on and medication is on, as I said, it is very close to zero. If stimulation is on and medication is off, the rest trauma velocity deviates. When stimulation is off and medication is on, we can see there is further perturbation. So I had modeled all these uh, capabilities, whether it is stimulation on or, and taking different permutations and combinations of whether the stimulation is on or the medication is on and so on. And various faults and anomalies were introduced inside these medical devices. And when it was introduced, I had introduced different kinds of uh, anomalies, which is spike attack, where, uh, um, where the patient was uh, receiving good stimulation and suddenly a spike was introduced in order to look how does the stimulation affects the rest tremor velocity versus the second plot, which is an, um, which is an outlier attack uh, or a false strategy where continuous spikes are given at regular intervals. The third type of faults which was introduced was stuck at attack where when the uh, measurement, the stimulation starts behaving uh, fraudulently, fraudulently, it starts giving wrong stimulation for a certain amount of time and then becomes good again. 
then incremental uh, tax strategy where the stimulation slowly and gradually increases. Next type was chronic attack, which increases and then decreases. Next was a noise attack where noise was introduced. Next was an unusual attack where different kind of uh, attack strategies or fault strategy was introduced. And one was genuine measurement where there was no attack uh, in the case of stimulation on and medication on, then how does the overall algorithm looks? So if we would look at the different um, uh, faults which was introduced in these uh, deep brain implants, and uh, I was observing or I was forecasting the deviation of the current stimulation as well as the next 20 predictions. If you would see that the current stimulation was showing some, the true data was if even if it is being affected by the adversary by giving wrong measurement, the uh, deep learning based algorithm, which was this recurrent neural network was predicting the next future as uh, the uh, the, uh, the same one. So the same thing, uh, one second, one, uh, one second, one second. Okay, one second, one second. Uh, sorry. So uh, if we would look at the different kind of uh, fault and st uh, attack strategy, the rest of my velocity was uh, the actual versus the predicted one was clearly differentiate, differentiating. Finally, to end my talk at this moment, I covered different kinds of things uh, in this talk. I talked about uh, the multi-layer perceptron model. How is it different with support vector machine? I also talked about uh, uh, different kinds of medical devices, whether it was diabetic uh, for insulin pump, for uh, cardiac defibrillator and even for deep brain implants. And we looked how deep learning algorithms was more accurate uh, than the other machine learning algorithms and the other biometric based and uh, cryptographic based algorithms which are presently out there. Mm -hmm. Finally, in order to conclude and provide some future work in this uh, direction is that so far, uh, all these algorithms that are being developed drains the battery in terms of how much uh, um, resources and device utilization is being done by these machine learning algorithm. The next state of the art, I would say the, uh, the future lies in these medical devices because all these uh, machine learning algorithms drain some kind of battery. We require some kind of lightweight and efficient and accurate uh, algorithms. How can we achieve them is using some kind of, I would say higher level Algorithms. So far, all these machine learning algorithms look at the lower level. How do we remember? How do we understand? How do we apply uh, based on our previous learning in order to achieve some kind of intelligence in the system? How, uh, why not we have higher levels of cognition, which include analyzing the uh, real world data and making and evaluating and creating our own assumptions rather than looking at the past behavior, which is purely on the supervised and unsupervised based learning. So I would say the next future, which lies in these medical devices or any kind of cyber physical systems, which include IoT devices, whether it is connected vehicles and so on, we require more of a reinforcement learning based algorithm where we can have actors which are taking the information from these uh, sensors and there is a critique which would be monitoring based on these um, actors, what they are performing and giving a reward. So we require more higher levels of cognition rather than moving into a lower levels of cognition, which focus at supervised and unsupervised learning. So that's all um, I wanted to cover in this talk. If you have any questions, I can answer that.